Hello and uh, welcome to the last in our series of Light Conversations and um, I'm really pleased today to be introducing Colin Ball who's an ILD member and works at BBP and Dr James Fox from the BBC Channel 4. We're supported today by Igazini and we're very grateful for all the support they've given us over the talks in the series and today we're going to be talking um, a lot about light, colour and society and the impact that's been having. Please can I have the next slide. So um, I'm Emma and uh, I work in the UK uh, to promote uh, the architectural lighting design community and I work doing that with Christopher Knowlton who is on our board of directors currently. Uh, if you have any questions about the IELD and what we do please contact me directly and you can do that through the website. Next slide please. So uh, as I mentioned before we're joined today by Colin Ball from the IELD and Dr James Fox from the BBC4. Please can I have the next slide. Colin and James are going to be discussing colour, light and image and they've deliberately spaced those words out on the page because each of those words have quite a huge significance and never more so than uh, today um, but as I, I'm sure James might say at any point in history never more so there's always been points in time where we can uh, use those words to describe what's happening and illuminate on what's happening currently in our society. Next slide please. Colin sat on the membership board for the IELD and has uh, used as that uh, position to do peer reviews on our work. So please do submit your membership applications to the IELD and know that they are taken care of greatly by people who care very much about our profession and how lighting design is used uh, to tell our stories on all our buildings. So Colin is currently a director at BDP London and he's working uh, primarily at the moment on relighting the Houses of Parliament. Next slide, please. James is a British art historian and BAFTA nominated broadcaster and frequently seen on the BBC. He's also super interesting and um, has a wealth of uh, information to partake to us uh, currently on, on his life, uh, living in lockdown and, and how that's been affecting him personally. And I'm very much interested on his uh, personal take on what's going on now and how we view the information that we've been given over our media channels. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pass over now to Colin in his, uh, in his lovely hands. And uh, afterwards, I will come back to them and ask them some of our lo lovely questions. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Emma. Um, uh, yeah, I've started um, our first image, which um, I've exchanged with James, uh, is essentially what do you do when you're obsessed with colour and you have COVID lockdown and you're locked in your home? Well, I was really lucky that a friend of mine for my birthday gave me a colour theory 1000 piece jigsaw. Um, and I, I, of course, being as arrogant as I am, thought, well, I know all about colour. This is going to be really easy. I'm going to do this in a in a few days. Three weeks later, I'm still struggling with everything that Joseph Albers has pointed out. As soon as you see one colour, it changes according to the colours next to it. This was really mind warping, I have to say. Uh, well, Colin, I uh, can we go to the next slide, uh, please, Joe? Because I also spent uh, some of lockdown <laughs> working on the jigsaw puzzle. There's mine, which is also a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. This is um, Vincent van Gogh's uh, wheat field in Cyprus, which I felt was very fitting for lockdown because he painted that when he was locked up in a psychiatric asylum. Uh, and this is the view that he imagined and partly glimpsed through his window. So that really felt very much like uh, my own experience of lockdown and many other people's, I'm sure, as well. But I don't know how you felt about this, Colin, but I, I, I felt that being trapped inside uh, for, for such a long period of time, especially when in the UK we had a fantastic spring, just yes. made light maybe more aware and more appreciative of light and colour and nature than I'd ever been before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing we talk about is essentially the qualities of daylight, etc. And I noticed it was on the Russian news, the American news, but everyone was saying, oh, my God, have you seen how blue the sky is? And I say mm -hmm. with the views here, that's been, I'd say it's been one of the highlights over the last few weeks. Did you learn anything new about the painting as you were looking at this? Because like I say, I, it startled me how much I thought I knew about colour. And I'd say well, this, like I've relearned it in some so many ways. 
Yeah, it, uh, this actually, this jigsaw took me about two months, so it took me a lot longer than your <laughs> colour jigsaw. Um, but um, I think what 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 uh, what actually surprised me about this painting, and what what made it quite difficult to do, was actually how few colours Van Gogh actually used in that painting. It looks like you've got loads of different colours, but actually he was using. Um, the, the same colour in lots of different parts of the picture. Um, so that made it really, really difficult to do because the, the, the kind of greeny blue you might find in the sky was also in the mountain and was also in one of the hedges. Um, uh, so there was a great, so the way he sort of wove together the colours like a tapestry made it extremely difficult to do. Wow, uh, that's fantastic. Can we have the next slide, please? Yep. I mean, this is a very strange image, but I wanted to go straight, and this is for the audience's benefit, was um, this is very much where me and James met. Um, and I'm aware Alessandra's in the audience. Hello, Alessandra. Um, Hello, Alessandra. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had a fascinating evening, which was just talking about colour. Um, and we had um, uh, Spike Bucklow was talking about the alchemy of pigments. David Batchelor was talking about the colours that he used. And Helen Zersky, I'm not sure if you can recognise to the audience the specific dress that she's wearing. Well, that is the dress from 2015. And I think we had, I think, uh, an hour, two hours of discussions on how each of our different disciplines um, discussed colour and what we were able to learn from each other. It's, it's been an inspiring evening that I still get inspired by now, three years later. It was a great evening and it was great, great to bring, uh, you know, five, five colour addicts together, because that's something that, 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 that brings us together, doesn't it, Colin? We're both ob obsessed with colour, and particularly that dress. Do you have, um, Joe, on the next slide, do you have the photograph of the dress? Yes. Now, yeah, this is the photograph. I, yeah. You go ahead, Colin. Yeah, yeah. When I was looking to select this, just for this slide now, because so many people have edited it since 2015, I still can't tell you now whether I've actually selected the right image, because I learned on that night that I see the wrong, you know, I can see white and gold. And the fascinating thing is it doesn't matter what I've done in the last five years, I try and tell myself, okay, look at it this way, look at it under this lighting, look at under this lighting. And as soon as I uh, recognize that this is the image, I, the thing that's hardwired into my head, before my eyes, it goes back to white and gold. It's remarkable. I'd be very interested to see how, how many of our listeners, um, uh, you know, or watchers, uh, <laughs> how, how, how it breaks down for them. It's a very interesting, I mean, I work a lot on colour science as well as colour in art. And uh, obviously the, the reason for the confusion comes down to this process called colour constancy, which is where our brains attempt to disentangle the colour of objects from the colour of light. Um, and the confusion uh, uh, here uh, sort of originates in the fact that the photograph is such poor quality that it's quite difficult for our brains to work out whether this is a blue and black dress in a sort of relatively neutral white light or whether it's mm. a white and gold dress in a blue light. Um, yeah. And what I find so, so fascinating about this image and I think is so revealing is I think it reveals to us how subjective colour is in so many ways. You know, many of us for a long time thought of colour, and it still seems the commonsensical thing to think of colour as a property of objects, that it kind of resides in the dress, the blueness or the blackness resides in the dress. And then, of course, people like Newton said that colour was actually a property of light. But now, of course, we know that colour is also the result of an extremely complicated process that takes place within us when when the light that hits the uh, our retinas is then converted and reconverted and reconverted again and sent from one cell to another along neural channels across synapses and then sent to the back of the brain where this very complicated comput computation takes place to convert the sort of photo, the scattergun chaos of photon absorption into the world of color and it means that all of us are actually seeing slightly different colors aren't we yeah, and yet, if you ask someone from their memory, what is a can of Coca-Cola, that red, mm. everyone thinks of one red. They don't think mm. of the 40,000 different shades of red. Now, I, yes. I was really relieved, actually, that because I had some members of my team in the audience that night, and they were getting really fed up with me of always including this image in, in our presentations. And they're like, Why are you, will you stop going on about that dress, please? And I was saying, it's the blue and gold 
is exactly the same blue and gold that we work with and we have been work with. Uh, so can I have the next slide? Ah, yeah, no, no, so sorry, you want to talk about architecture first, sorry. No, but, um, but, 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 this is, but this is exactly um, this relationship of blue and gold as in the relationship to the out, outside and external light uh, into the interiors and essentially this idea of warm candle lit interiors. There's an evolution of our eyesight uh, that we basically, as soon as we get it wrong in lighting, we tend to get the complaints of a space being too smoky and too dark in the morning mm. when people want to concentrate, but then everyone is complaining about a space being um, too bright and glaring in the evening. So that we've known for the last 20 odd years that there is this ongoing shift, but gradually over the last 20 years, scientists and physicists and neuroscientists um, have, have really called out and given us the information as designers that we were experiencing in the field. Mm. So it's been a fascinating relationship. Well, the reason I brought, brought, brought uh, so supplied this image here uh, is that in some ways, perhaps they've always been lighting designers. Maybe they've never been, a, ne maybe they haven't known themselves as lighting designers or indeed even architects uh, didn't, you know, didn't exist as a, as a kind of profession in that sense. They might have been master builders. But I include this image, which is the interior of the baptistry in Florence. It's about a thousand years old. And of course, it's important, I suppose, to remember me, I'm an art historian, that um, for, for most of history, most interiors were pretty dark because you know they didn't they, they, they you know they didn't have electric light, they didn't have particularly big windows, but there were all these clever methods and technologies used to create light effect inside uh, buildings. And one of them uh, was this one that you can see here, which is using gold mosaic. Uh, it was an incredibly clever piece of technology. Essentially, it was quite simple. It was a it was a piece of gold leaf that was sandwiched by two pieces of glass. And so, what would happen is if you had candlelight inside the inside the building, the candlelight would move through the glass, would be magnified by the glass, would be reflected by the gold leaf behind the glass, then magnified again by the other piece of glass, and then bounced back into the room. And if you had thousands of pieces of mosaic, maybe even millions of pieces of mosaic, all lined up slightly differently, you would get this amazing, almost sacred golden glow inside these buildings. Uh, and then, of course, can we have the next slide, Joe? There we are. Yeah, and then, you know, this is 200 years later as the Gothic emerged, uh, Gothic architecture emerged, all these new architectural technologies, uh, 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 you know, occurred, such as flying buttresses and ribbed vaulting that enabled uh, the sort of these kind of thick walls to be dissolved into windows. This is one of my favorite buildings. It's Saint Chapelle in, yep. in Paris. Same, same here. Uh, uh, it is an incredible building. There are more than a thousand stained glass windows in there. Um, and of course, they have this wonderful ability through stained glass of being able to turn light into, into colour uh, and, to, and to flood the space. And what also always remarks amazes me about that building is, I mean, this is a building that's 800 years old, and yet it's got almost as much glass uh, as a modern office block, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this this building and also King's College Chapel um, a very uh, modern architect and technologist would struggle to get more glass to the stone ratio as what they achieved there. I mean, they really did sort of um, achieve what was the ultimate in translucency. Now, I've used this image as well myself, because in the two colour pieces that I wrote, um, the first uh, was about why we use blue so much, which we did in the millennium in the 90s. And Sorry, it was that's this... my son, by the way. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, um, he's uh, the blue. What I noticed was when you step into space, like that photograph that you're seeing there has got a very gold quality, whereas you step into it physically, there is this sort of blue hanging in the air. And I noticed it as well with the uh, Giotto wall paintings in Assisi, mm. that I walked mm. out of a cathedral that was like dazzlingly blue. And yet when I looked at the photographs, it was full of golden red. Um, mm. And a very similar thing you get with what we call the Blue Mosque and the Turkish school Sultan Ahmet is um, that there's actually, there's as much red in this glass as there is blue. And mm. that's where it's like the red stays as a material 
and it's a very mm. physical color of physicality whereas blue transmits and hangs in the air so it has this spiritual quality and that's where just talking about color and light is um that's the thing i've been investigating for the last 10 years mm. on how light reaches the eye in a different way or transmits inside the eye and so that property of light on that color has lent each color its unique um mm. sort of value to society i wonder what you and your colleagues think about blue because i, I think um blue has this strange personality in that it's um it, it, it's it's akin to both day and 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 night to, to brightness and darkness we associate blue with a with a bright sunny day and the sky the bright sunny sky on a summer's and day otherness. but we also associate it with 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 the nocturnal don't we and filmmakers if they're trying to simulate a nocturnal scene they'll put a blue filter or haze over there uh, over there over their shots if they're shooting it at daytime and i wonder how that uh, you know for, for someone working in this environment with blue light um, how you how you try and juggle those two personalities. Yeah. Well, we used to use it a lot. And I think there was one of the reasons when we looked at blue um, was there was the thing of um, uh, the high expense of it, the quality, because in the 1990s and before blue LEDs existed, um, to produce blue, because it was such a small percentage of white light, you had to use twice as much power. So it cost mm. twice as much as all the other colors. So it was the rarest one. So it was the one that we're all looking to achieve. And of course, in the 90s, we didn't have the value on energy and watts per square meter that we do now. Um, so there was this, and you see it as a very sort of millennial style of uh, lighting that there would be this whole sea of deep blue. I mean, one of the questions we asked, and this was back um, uh, 15 years ago, was why has London turned blue? I had uh, actually the architect of Canary Wharf said, why is London blue? What's going on? And it was, well, it was just all of us competing lighting designers <laughs> putting more money into creating a better and better blue. Um, and then blue LEDs came along and suddenly anyone could produce it. And it was the same cost and value. So it's almost like there's been a trend ever since. Um, the International Lighting Fair, Frankfurt, used to uh, have, again, 15 years ago, there would be dense blue light on the stands or the car shows, the car stands would have this amazing blue sort of clean technology vision of the future. Whereas now everything about sensitivity and energy and quality the sort of the sense of putting a human first is now all those same stands are very warm candle lit um, mm. and there's this sort of golden glow now across lighting stands and and also in sort of like our vision of the future because it's become more ecological has moved away from this expensive rich color which again feeds into its original you know one of the pigment names mm. ultramarine is the most mm. expensive the most mm. distant i wonder whether i mean I, i'm very interested in uh, I'm sure what, what, you, what you think and what your colleagues think about you know how important leds are in terms of changing the the landscape of our you know the visual landscape of our lives and there's certainly the one thing i've noticed a, a change of is that in the uk until recently most streets were illuminated by these yellow sodium lights yeah. and one by one those are those sort of high pressure whatever they're low pressure sodium uh, sodium lights are being replaced by whiter bluey whiter LEDs. And so we're beginning to see the nocturnal colors of our cities change as a result, I presume, of LEDs. Mm. Yeah, we get you get more sense of a color, but there's a lower um, um, there's a lower level of light, even though you can see more color. But um, there is an intrinsic relationship, as in the same LEDs. Everyone was uh, famously told again three four years ago that our phones and the leds and our phones were keeping us awake at night mm -hmm. uh, that those same leds are appearing in the streets so um yes we have astronomers and other professionals and now actually ecologists are actually starting to campaign for us to go back to red and amber lights because <laughs> those pale white lights are having a much more a uh, dramatic effect on local wildlife. So sky pollution is far worse. Um, right. it's, it's been quite a surprising discovery. Um, yeah, if we go to the next slide, 
I'll show you there's um it, this is this is this blue gold relationship mm. and this mm. um sketchy diagram as you say we've already moved on to LEDs as part of a discussion but I like to keep in this diagram exactly uh, the description of the different lamps we used to use. And I used to use this as a training device, but also um, how to, you know, sort of explain the scheme to the clients, which was using daylight, but there was a cool blue or the blue presence was a daylight concentration above your head. And that every mm. space, depending on how you're going to use it and when you're going to use it, is the issue of the light in its greatest intensity going from above your head to below. And it's almost like if I sum this up a uh, skylight to candle, uh, actually addresses this sort of um, visual evolution that we have, but it ex expresses the comfort of the people inside the spaces. But I've continued to use it now that these lamps don't exist because <laughs> all of that daylight is something that is free, we don't have to pay for, as long as we've understood the daylight of the building. And I think that's something our profession has really changed with in the last uh, 15 years, that we've become designers of the lighting experience rather than just specifying lamps and putting funny mm. colors into the interiors of buildings. There's been quite a transformation in the last um, few decades. Um, one next slide. I think gives us an example. So this is essentially a concrete building with wood finishes. It's the new student center in uh, UCL. But you see what it has is there's only low level candlelight or gold light in the parts away from the daylight. But where there is mm. daylight coming into the building, we haven't put any lamps at all. So we've actually pulled the lighting scheme like, away from nearly a third of the building. So it's become a bit of a challenge these days to because we're producing emptier and emptier drawings but saying it's okay it's okay you've got the light here trust us but we're only able to do that now because we've got the modeling technology of the daylight itself but this is so something is that part of a broader trend then colin of just a broader trend of you know using less light we're trying we're campaigning yes um this is a, a sort of a technique where we're putting less light fittings in and just giving you raw material. Um, mm. We're able to justify it with lower energy, but there's a, let's say the resistance in the industry is still you know, health and safety, light levels. And again, there's an entire industry that's, that's nearly the size of the oil or the cars that's trying to sell light fittings. So mm. we're actually um, looking at the quality of the space more than the quantity but it's uh so in many ways we're actually sort of putting more effort into integrating the light into the design of the building so that the building itself is a lantern and so mm. it's in some ways as you say it's considering the materials the windows mm. what the reflective material is more than just saying here's a lamp put a light here and it will shine mm. so mm. um but it's still embedded in color. But all of that color is a, like a nuance of white these days, mm. which is something quite different. Um, next slide. And this was, again, this, this sort of scheme was produced out of this study of the specific properties of blue and the specific properties of red, where we discovered there was this sort of luxurious and the evening feeling. Um, mm. And even though we're using LEDs, we use specific phosphors to push the LEDs into a really high end of the red spectrum because mm. we knew that our lighting was only there for nighttime. This was Wolfgang Buttress um, and it was the uh, Milan Expo Pavilion for the UK. Mm -hmm. And it's this is a sort of a live link up to a real beehive. So this was an mm. idea of a, a sculpture a landscape of the relationship and the meaning for feed the world. So there was a lot of meaning uh, embedded in the in the light and the animation of it. So it's quite a, mm. a powerful symbolic piece, but entirely embedded in this relationship of what time of the day you were seeing it and what we'd learned from our studies in color. Mm. Uh, next slide. Yes. So I wanted to. Um, the other piece, I mean, we, we were connected with colour and then 
since we met about three years ago, we've both um, explored the idea of image um, mm. uh, uh, since then. And uh, I presented about two years ago this idea of, uh, as you say, LEDs are in our phones, LEDs are in our screens. We're now becoming much more of an internal creature. I asked the question of if we've got LEDs in our street lights, in our screens, how much light entering our eyes is actually digital light now? How much are we moving away from yeah. this organic world and becoming consumed? And one of the ideas of this piece was an 18 meter screen that we've put right in our entrance door in our office. And I secretly called it Plato's Cave with the shadows of people walking around, making it appear backlit. But it was this idea of um, that we're completely immersed in image and in many ways mm. our relationship with physicality, 3D, 2D. So I was amazed to see earlier this year that you, that's what you've been working on for the last um, two yes, years. I I Yes, I mean, I, I actually discuss in, in in one of my projects. I discuss um, Plato's cave, which, for those who don't know, it's that it's a, uh, an allegory in which these prisoners are uh, trapped in the the basement of in some dark cave, and behind they're they're sort of chained facing the wall, and behind them there's a there's a fire, and this fire casts shadows in front of them onto the cave wall. And they presume, because they've never seen anything else, they've never been out of the cave, they've never moved, they presume those shadows are reality. And it's only when they turn around and they exit the cave that they realise they were only looking at reflections or shadows of reality. And, uh, you know, so in, in that sense, what Plato was trying to allude to is the fact that you know, we are, as human beings, we are very susceptible to images. We are very um, dependent on them. But last year, as Colin is saying, I made a uh, series for the BBC called Age of the Image, which argued that in the last 100, 120 years or so, we have become more dependent on the image, on images than ever before. You know, from the rise of cinema in the 1890s to the to the first point and shoot camera, which was the, the, the first major point and shoot camera in 1900, the box brownie, through to television, all the way through to now to such an extent that we are taking more photographs every minute than were taken in the entire 19th century now. And we spend hours of our day uh, six, between six and ten hours staring into screens, staring at LEDs. Six to ten hours of, exactly, so our On mind average. being reconfigured in a digital environment. This is something that's brand new, we've not seen before. I mean, I, I love the fact that you started your series with everyone outside the front of the Mona Lisa mm -hmm. and everyone's there in front of the, the most famous picture of the world, like looking at their phone mm -hmm. and not looking mm -hmm. at the Mona Lisa. Everyone seems to have changed their behavior in how to look. Absolutely. I think that these new technologies that have emerged in the last 120 years or so have not only changed what we see, but how we see and how we look. Um, and I must say, Colin, I think that probably this year, 2020, has been peak image. I think this is as, <laughs> as image saturated Here we are. as we get. Hello. Hello. Well, we're, we're, we're images now. We've both been turned into images. But no, I think it's a serious point in some ways because you know when you think of the lockdown uh, that that we have most of us been experiencing since March time, you're socially distanced, you're cut off from the world around you, and you become therefore very dependent on on the the the, the image as an intermediary to do your job, to mm. connect with your family, to speak to your friends to find entertainment and escape you are ultimately going to be looking at screens and images and i just think if uh, i i can't imagine how lockdown would have been without netflix exactly. without television without zoom without facetime um how unbearable and challenging it would have been well we've been yeah. uh, we've had i mean this is something i say about as a lighting designer people say oh do you make spaces look pretty and I sort of say, no, we're responsible for 40 percent of the consciousness of the global economy. <laughs> Discuss. You know, it's it's I think without this sense of image or connectivity, people would we'd almost go back 150 years, I think. Mm. Absolutely. And I think that going I mean, I think we what we both wanted to because so many uh, 
serious events are taking place at the moment, in addition to the pandemic, political events, uh, we thought, I thought it'd be a good point, I thought we both thought it'd be a good opportunity to talk about how that relates to the image. So uh, if, if it's possible to, uh, Joe, to uh, move on to uh, the next Just slide, or it might be... Oh, sorry, yes. I just oh, wanted... you do want to talk about yeah. this first? Yeah, so, sorry, before we go, I just wanted to talk about, um, with this space and this screen, there was something that very unusual happened was we put the image and we almost like put it into the space and made it a piece of architecture so the images were almost like eye level so you saw a human being at eye level you saw the image the perspective in the image in the perspective in the room and what happened was within uh, two years we were hosting events on the screen we were no longer hosting the space we were hosting the screen so here was a strange event of actually a a French fashion designer, Chantal Thomas, <laughs> launching an LED dress. But this this was almost like unlocked people's behavior in how to engage mm. with the space. It produced something really creative. Um, we go next slide. I just wanted to end on this idea of image and how it's influenced architecture as well, is a contemporary mm. space in West London. This is um, a, a gallery for Rocker. And um, uh, the interesting thing about for the architecture here was it was the interior design and it being photographed was everything that mattered mm. um, more so than its location it didn't have to have an expensive rent in the city of London it could be anywhere in London because its market was about its ph photographability and how it was to be broadcast across the internet so everything about image was what created this space for the internal viewer and then the final thing in that was we had to put the lighting in so we put our warm cool balance but all of that was removed by the photographer because the photographic image was more important in the space than the actual physical mm. space the skin and the human being so this was something that i thought that yes you can actually see how architecture itself has started to change and adapt Mm. around this relationship of image people and um, spaces people are in so so yes this is our next image I think I put in as uh, again this is a very mundane everyday COVID this is how mm. we're being consumed now let's say by the image and we're seeing small children are actually um, there's a campaign and an education device where children are on treasure hunts and putting up the rainbow symbol in the window. I and it's colour very... and light again there, Colin, <laughs> just for us. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, I mean, talk about, finish with this discussion about the, the, the image and the power of the image in, in 2020 yes. with the next slide, please, Joe. Yep. Because, you know, we've been talking about, uh, you know, coronavirus and how image has been very important uh, in the way we negotiate that. But of course, the um, the protests that we're that are ongoing uh, as we speak at the moment around the world, in fact, those two were provoked ultimately by an image, an image of uh, George Floyd being uh, killed by a police officer. And of course, it, it's not the first example of that. Um, because if you think back, the first image on the top left I've got there, that's, um, that, that, those are the, that's the footage of Selma from 1965 when it was caught on news camera of uh, po police uh, attacking civil rights protesters in Selma. Bottom left is when uh, the footage of Rodney King from 1991 being beaten uh, in Los Angeles. And of course, on the right is the is the footage uh, of George Floyd, some of the footage of George Floyd. And what's interesting to me for someone who's interested in te the technology of image making is how these th this narrative encompasses the change in visual technology. So the top left, you know, Selma was recorded by news cameras. Rodney King was recorded by someone with his camcorder in the early 90s. And of course, now people are uh, recording uh, these kinds of scenes through their camera phones. Um, uh, and that, for me, is fascinating. And I think that the implication of this is that images have become so powerful now, and over the last century, really, that they don't just report or record or represent history happening or social change they 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 are they provoke social change they bring it about uh, and that i think r reminds us how important images are and if i can move to the final slide that i introduced as well please joe 
This one is from, I think, is it yesterday or the day before? It's difficult to keep track of time in lockdown, but I think it's, uh, it's yes, probably, Sunday. was it yesterday? Or yeah, this, is, um, this is a scene from, from Bristol uh, in, in the west of England, where a statue of a slave trader, uh, which was up in the center of the city, was um, uh, pulled down by Black Lives Matter protesters and thrown into the harbor. Um, and regardless of whatever your view is on the destruction or the uh, removal of that statue, it I think is a reminder that images, whether they are you know stained glass windows, whether they're mosaics, whether they are uh, photographs of dresses or jigsaw puzzles or statues, uh, that they have immense power, they have meaning, so much meaning that we, we tear them down um, uh, and they have great symbolic significance. Do you th think, I mean, with the these appalling images that we've seen uh, and we've seen for the last 30 years, the, the power of um, uh, the image um, from just the last two weeks has been that it was recorded by passers-by by their own hands. So these, mm. this is this is imagery that you could have taken. There's a increased mm. um, personal responsibility for all of us to no longer look away. This image has to be mm. there in front of us, and none of us can yes. deny it now. So so all of us are now responsible in who we are, what we do, who we engage with, that we are fair and that we are equal to everyone around and that we recognize that black people in particular have had this additional struggle. Absolutely, I think that, and it's a relatively recent phenomenon that people have been able to do this. You know, if you think even September the 11th, that was what, 19 years ago, 9-11, people didn't really, there were some camera phones out, but there wasn't really, people didn't really have a widespread ability to re record that information by themselves. Whereas a few years later, when you get to the tsunami, for instance, in Thailand, where people were re recording things on their phones, and then the the, 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 re the revolts in, in uh, across the Arab world as well, in the Islamic world mm. leading up to this citizens are playing ordinary people are playing enormously important roles in not just through recording images but then being able to share them online to, to millions of people around the world instantly and that changes our role as citizens um, and and uh, and I think that's a really important development Yes, and it makes each of us responsible, I think, as well. Yeah. That, that, mm. and so, so no one can, as you say, turn away with uh, the thing I find in terms of a paradigm change that's happening is what you see in the last two weeks is just the simple phrase is silence is complicity. And that comes mm. and that that is, you know, that's the power of this. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, chat. Hello. Uh, in at the end. Um, James, I just have a I have got a question for you, and then I have a question for Colin before we wrap up oh. and, and uh, put, put babies to bed and so on. Um, James, would you say that the role of the editor is probably now more important than ever ever because images have been available to to us uh, through paintings and photographs forever, and um, you know, employed in certain ways to sell certain stories. Uh, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, examples of an image taken one second and an, another image a few seconds later that could tell a completely different story. So do you think that the edit editing and the storytelling of those images is uh, of high significance? Well, I actually probably think the opposite in some ways, in that I think that because uh, people are now able to post their own footage, camera phone footage, their own photographs, their own stories directly onto a platform online, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or whatever it is, the, the, the middleman, if you like, which, which was so important for so long, the middleman being the broadcast news or the newspapers or the magazines who made these editorial choices and decided which photograph are we going to use for this story? Um, which, uh, you know, which a piece of footage are we going to use for this part of the news? Those uh, individuals are kind of losing some of their power, which means that, um, which means in some ways that images um, can become less reliable in some ways, you know, because there's less of a process through which those people are deciding is this is this a correct representation? Is that a correct representation? But it also makes it very exciting and unpredictable. And, and we're also seeing that the same image can divide an audience 50-50 
as they're looking at it, that's now become reality, isn't it? That, that we understand that everyone's looking at it differently. Well, my question for you, as we, we're, um, you know, it, we're in 2020, which I thought was, you know, space odyssey. You know, we're, we're in, we're in that, which feel hoverboards <laughs> and uh, wearing silver suits. Uh, what is the, if blue, blue was, is so yesterday and so 90s, what do you think the colour of uh, architectural lighting is at the moment? What, what colour are we using right now? Um, I, th I think everyone is obsessed with that warm quality. It's the sort of the last, um, the the sort of the really expensive quality people are trying to achieve is that low candlelight quality. Mm. Every because everyone's we're surrounded by light, flickering images, 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 and I think the more we get to just that quiet, intimate candle, that piece of peace, you know, like the switch down. And I find that that's the bit that people are really reacting to these days. The less light you give them, the happier they are because it's we're so overstimulated. I think that's actually something that we've we've not spoken about in the last um, sort of 10 minutes is actually the stimulation, stimulation, this engagement, engagement, always being on the front end and outside of our mind, not being contemplative. You know, you know, as, as you say, the gold leaf of those ceilings you showed are essential, you know, they come alive with a single candle. And I think that's, mm. that, that, that's, we're really noticing that we're missing that now. Mm. I think that's quite true. And I think we all quite take a comfort in a bit of nostalgia in the past, don't we? Because it's happened. <laughs> Which yeah. becomes like a unique it's confine to bath time or away from children. There's definitely comfort in that and us having a bit of fire glaze, gazing. Um, Thank you so much, both of you, for joining me today. And I very much hope you'll join us again in the future uh, to uh, talk about your experiences and how you how you view things. So thank you, uh, Dr. James Fox, and thank you, Colin. Thank if you, you. Want thank you. If our conversations that we've had, you can view them on YouTube. Uh, so please do that. We look forward to seeing you very soon. A big thank you to everybody that's taken part. Thank you.